Well, this morning we are continuing our series on the parallel Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, as we look at how they complement one another, how they follow the story of Jesus in the New Testament, and the building up of what God is seeking to accomplish through his Son. And today we come to a beautiful passage, one that is, that is full of um, beauty and mystery, and actually all four Gospels refer to this moment. And it's a beautiful perspective. It's one that is just so sweet. It's, it feels intimate that we are right there seeing what Jesus is up to. If you remember last week, last week we discussed how John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. He was the one that paved the way. He told everyone that the Messiah was coming. He was quite an interesting guy in what he wore and what he ate and the, the company that he kept or lack thereof. He called people out. He said some pretty bold things, not quite as bold as Jesus, but certainly bold. Um, We know that John the Baptist was referring often, reflecting on follow Jesus, don't follow me. He was referring that Jesus was the Messiah, but he had spoken it in many different ways. and, And then this is where the rubber hits the road or the gravel hits the path. I don't know what you'd say in those days. But John is observing such a beautiful happening. So as we open our Bible, you're going to have to be a little bit nimble today because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's hard to keep a finger in each of those passages. So I don't know if you want to tear a little piece of your bulletin off and stick it here and stick it there, or if you just want to get uh, excited with your app and swipe, swipe around really fast. But I want us to follow the story, and I'm not going to read in entirety each one of them, but I want you to see and appreciate what's happening here. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, we see that Jesus goes from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Now, Galilee wasn't a very impressive town. This is not an impressive river. If you've seen the Jordan River, you wouldn't be like, ooh, I just want to go get baptized there. It's not the most pleasant place. People would have washed their clothes. There would have been animals drinking from it. There was all kinds of stuff in the water. It was not the most pleasant water. There's nothing special about the water. It was a place that John declared I want to preach the good news, and this is where he is doing it. And in Matthew 13, it it continues on in 14, that Jesus approaches John and says, I want to be baptized by you. And John says quickly, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, so why are you coming to me? He goes on in 15, it should be done. This is Jesus. It should be done for We must carry out all that God requires. So John agrees to baptize him. After this, we see that the Spirit of God descends on Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove. And we hear the audible voice of God the Father. This is something that I want you to kind of lock into your mind. The audible voice of God doesn't happen very often. And this is a beautiful, intimate, sweet, powerful, amazing moment. And the voice of God says to his son, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We looked at, to Mark, verse, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Mark is much quicker he just, he's like, he's, if you go up to somebody and you say, just the facts, please, that's basically what he does. His is very quick, so there's not much to to stay in there for today. But Luke chapter 3, we see in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, he says he's baptizing the crowds, and it's almost like Jesus was next in line. Because one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. Leaves out some of the story from Matthew where there's a discussion between Jesus and John. But then we go to John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, and we see a little bit 
a little bit more of the details, a few more bits of the conversation that are really powerful. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. 32, then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest on is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Amen? Amen. These words are full of authority, full of power. If you could imagine yourself in John's place, he had to hurry up and wait. Has anybody ever given you that beautiful bit of information? Go ahead and hurry up and wait. And forever, it feels like sometimes. Whatever the issue is, that just seems like it couldn't come fast enough. But John is faithful. He de- he's a He studies scripture. He understands his role, that he is to be the forerunner, the one who would go before and tell everyone that the Messiah is coming. He's excited about his job. He loves what he does, but he's also passionate in that he wants people to repent of their sin and be baptized. So you see, John's baptism was one of repentance But he's saying at some point, God revealed to him in John chapter 1, verses um, 33 and 34, he didn't know that this would be the Messiah, but he says it was revealed to him that there would be one who the Holy Spirit would descend upon. So in this moment, when he accepts the opportunity to baptize Jesus, we see in Matthew that he was a bit confused and perplexed because why me how could I do this but Jesus reminds him this is God's plan this is something that God has ordained that I'm supposed to do so he agrees to do it but as he baptizes Jesus and he comes out of the water in that moment he still doesn't know if Jesus is the one imagine that He even declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was pretty sure. Have you ever been pretty sure, but not quite 100% sure? Well, that leads me into that moment in my life, and perhaps you've been there in your life, when, and you've probably heard this around in society, maybe you've even said it yourself, that you look for a miracle. You look for a sign. You just wish that God would reveal it just a little bit more. God, if you would do this, just do it just a little bit more. Make it clear, God, that this is your plan. I just want to know. I want to see a sign. I want, has anybody ever heard somebody, if I could just see God, or if I could just see a miracle, or if, if God would just stop this, or fix this, or do this, th- then I'd believe. I don't think this is exactly where John's at, but I, see it. I catch a little bit of that tone in there. I catch a little bit of that thought process. I'm not real sure. I think he's the son of God. I think he's the, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure. And then he comes out of the water. Can you imagine the scene at this point moving forward? The heavens, I don't know if they parted a little bit, but we see a dove descending upon him. Can you imagine John stepping back and going, oh boy, a dove descending upon him. And then through the through the crowd noise, I'm sure there, maybe there was people chatting and there was a little bit of dialogue and people wondering what was going on. Maybe, who is this? Isn't that Jesus from, from Galilee? Who is that guy? What is, what's going on? But then there's a voice from heaven. It wasn't just a voice that Jesus alone heard. It wasn't a voice that just John and Jesus heard. It says that there was a crowd that was there to be baptized. And when the heavens released God's authoritative voice and says, this is is my son who I'm very pleased with. Can you imagine the affirmation of the Holy Spirit descending? Can you imagine the affirmation of God's voice speaking of his son? Now, I don't know what it would mean to be Jesus. I can't even 
imagine any of his life, hardly. But I have to think in his humanness, because he was 100% God, 100% human, that in his humanness, there had to be a bit of him that was joyful. I even imagine excitement, a sense of, that's my father's voice. I don't know how long it had been since there had been an audible voice, but I imagine that God, he talked with his father often. But how reassuring, how beautiful is this moment that Jesus is spoken to by the Father. And people will argue, and I've already described this a bit, but there's the constant argument that if God would just rid a, the world of suffering, of pain, sorrow, problems, then I'd believe. I mean, how, many, how far do you have to go in a day to wish that there wasn't pain and suffering? I mean, we see so much pain. We see so much suffering. And in our humanness, we, we can say, I'm so sorry. But in our humanness, we also think, oh, I've been there. I've experienced a bit of that. But I want us to capture and appreciate that in the teachings of Jesus and the stories of Jesus, and we haven't even gotten into his miracles, we haven't even gotten to the Sermon on the Mount, we haven't even gotten to all of the trials and tribulations, the joys set before Jesus, the sorrows set before Jesus, all of the things that he experienced, we haven't even gotten to all of those. But if he is the Son of God, if he is the Messiah to come, then this in essence is God's answer for all time that although you have pain and suffering and sin in this world, I will send my son to fix that problem so that you might have life if you would believe in Jesus, so that you might have true purpose and joy if you would believe in this Messiah. You won't find it anywhere else. I mean, this world will chase it in all different shapes and sizes. It'll chase it through drugs. It'll, tra it'll chase it through um, all the media so outlets where you're just trying to find peace in the world, but all you end up finding is all the problems of the world whenever you turn it on. You see, we're real good about amplifying the problem, saying, how, look how bad this is getting. Can you believe it? it I, mean, I mean, my parents... There were so many times we'd watch the news growing up and my parents would have a new thing on the list that I couldn't do. Well, you can't go there anymore. Well, you can't do that anymore. You better stop that. Can't have any fun. I mean, it, that's what I heard, but that's probably not what they meant. <laughs> but that's kind of what it feels like. There's so much struggle, so much strife. Well, you better just lock yourself away because there's just sin everywhere. Good grief. What are we supposed to do? But as we see all of this sin and pain and, and suffering... It causes me to lean into God because I wouldn't know the joy and the truth and the, the beauty of being redeemed if I hadn't experienced sin. I wouldn't know what it's like to live a life that is free and full of the Holy Spirit in my life where I am set free and I'm no longer held accountable for my sin. Yes, my sin was taken to the cross and it is paid for by Jesus Christ and now I want to live for God. I don't want to pursue sin anymore. So because I know how evil and wicked sin is, I know how beautiful my Savior is. Without knowing how bad it can be, we don't know how good it can be. And if you've experienced the life change, then you understand that God is, he's stepping into creation. He's already here. He's 30 years old about right now in this story. He steps into creation because he's beginning something beautiful. And I tried to capture my thoughts in one sentence as I prepared for today. And it says, our Messiah is here. Salvation has come, and God's rescue plan is just getting started. The Holy Spirit is upon Jesus, and I don't think that it ever departed from Jesus. A bit of me thinks that this Holy Spirit entering of Jesus moment was for the crowd. So they could see, and they could say, He is the one. I also want us to just, 
I don't want to chase this theological bunny trail too far because it's really complicated and I think we could get caught up and spend the rest of our time there. Maybe that'd be worth it sometime. But this is one of those, one of those big moments. If you believe that the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are real and that the Godhead is three in one, this is one of the revealing moments that declares that it is happening and it is true. And this is how God reveals himself to us. You have the Son who's physically there. You have the Holy Spirit who enters him in the form of a dove. We know that the Holy Spirit is active and that is what is to come for us as well, those who believe. And we hear the Father's voice. So Trinitarians love this passage because this reveals that God reveals himself in these three distinct, powerful, agreeable, together ways. We don't see this very often, but we know it to be true, but I just want you to, maybe you put a note in your Bible to help you remember that this is how God reveals himself as the Holy Trinity. When we look at these three different, these four, excuse me, these four different gospel accounts of the baptism of Jesus, you begin to understand and see the magnitude of what is taking place. You see, I think there's some bigger things at play here that made John struggle. One, if he, if he knew that Jesus was this Messiah, if he was starting to understand and appreciate that he was the Messiah, it would have been overly complicated for him to say, I can baptize you. John was self-admittedly a sinful man, a good man, a prophet, one who was the forerunner for Jesus, but he was still a sinner. How could a sinner baptize the Son of God? Well, scriptures foretell this, and we see this throughout, but we also, we can understand the magnitude. And John's message, I want us to appreciate John's message was a a baptism of repentance of sin. So it's also complicated in his mind. He said, this man is with no sin. Now, he knew he wasn't the judge and the jury over Jesus, but if he was the Messiah, then he had to be sinless. So if he is supposed to baptize this sinless man, what in the world am I doing here, Jesus? How could I ever baptize you? You have no sin. You have nothing to repent for. But this is not that kind of baptism. This is not a baptism that was happening in John's day. This is a new era of Jesus saying his baptism, his his participation in, in accepting the Holy Spirit into his life is a new form of baptism. This is saying, I follow you, God, and I am accepting your Holy Spirit into myself. And I want the whole world to know that I'm following you. So this baptism is a new era that is taking place. We also have to appreciate that there is a phrase in here that can get, can get us a little bit squeamish, a little bit more... Um, probably irritated or why in the world do they do things like that and I don't want to just bypass verses that can be complicated but we see that in a couple of different passages specifically John refers to it here John 1 29 when he sees Jesus coming he doesn't say look it's Jesus my cousin come on in the water no he says a very specific with the phrase that is weird The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now that phrase would mean a lot more than it does to us. The Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Well, that's that's pretty specific. You see, nations when or family groups, when they had they would go to offer sacrifice and they would take an unblemished lamb that had been raised with the family. Basically, you named the lamb, you loved the lamb, the lamb was beautiful, it stayed in your home. You wanted the perfect, spotless lamb because you would lay your hands on it and you would ask the priest to sacrifice the lamb. This this lamb represented you saying, and I want to be forgiven. I want to offer my sins up to you, God, and I want to be re- repentant of all my sin. So when he's calling Jesus the lamb of God who was slain, this made all kinds of sense to the people in the water and the people that are standing around. The lamb of God, this is different. Had he been the lamb 
prior to Jesus' time, they would have been, yeah, this is a lamb that we take to sacrifice for all the people. But now Jesus is being paired up and merged with this statement. He, in essence, is the lamb of God who would be slain for all people for all time because he was the perfect spotless lamb. And this is being revealed for the first time. He is perfect. He is spotless. He is your sacrifice. Now, he didn't do this just because. He did it because he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. You see, we can't have a relationship with God unless we are pure and spotless. And we can't do that ourselves. We need a sacrifice to be right with God. And the only sacrifice that is righteous and good and holy is if God does it for us. You see, they had to keep sacrificing lambs. Lambs were being slaughtered every day. The sacrificial system pleased God, but this was an eternal pleasing that could not have come any other way. We, aren't you glad we're not bound to the sacrificial system anymore? I mean, if, if that were the case, I've told people they don't really appreciate this statement, but my job would be a lot bloodier than it currently is. Uh, this would be a really rough job. I don't know if I would have accepted it. I probably wouldn't have moved. I said, you can find somebody local. I don't want to do that. But this job now, it's like we're all forerunners like John the Baptist. We are proclaiming that there is one that I prefer. This is Jesus the Messiah. He is the one that we follow. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. We don't have to sacrifice anymore. Jesus is the sacrificial system. He he is the one that satisfies the law. He is the one that satisfies our sinful quota. He is the one that is to come to, to save us. <clears throat> As we continue, there are a couple of elements that I want us to focus on. In John... Chapter 1, verse 30, hopefully you've got that close by. I want us to remember this before we move into the couple of points that I want to make today. In verse 30, John says, after he's saying he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, verse 30, he is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. <coughs> As I consider this, there's a lot that's said in that little sentence. <clears throat> Imagine John, who is the older cousin. I don't know if he ever really used that card, but he is the older cousin. I mean, Elizabeth, his mother, was well advanced in age. If you know your, your New Testament history, uh, when Elizabeth and Mary encounter one another, John is actually filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment, in the womb, and he's jumping around in Elizabeth's belly. I don't know if you've ever had a baby in your belly, but I'm sure that's exciting. I will never experience that. Uh, but this is quite a moment. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's also amazing that he is born a few months prior to Jesus, so his statement in verse 30 is also quite ridiculous. But it's also prophetic he's not just saying it just to say it he is saying that jesus is older than him and if you did your math you'd be like no he's not well look again at verse 30 verse 30 says a man is coming after me who is far greater than i am so he moves himself down on the pedestal and he said he existed long before me. This, my friends, is speaking to God being with us forever prior to this moment. He's also speaking that Jesus existed at the beginning. Jesus is God. He is creator God. He is the I am. He is the way, the truth, and the life that hasn't even been said in the book of John yet. He is revealing that this Jesus 
is far greater than we can comprehend with a simple statement. Let's look at a couple of thoughts here. The first thought that we're going to look at is Christ is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The second thought is Jesus is the Messiah. And the third part is for us to apply and to consider ourselves. How should this change us? When we look at Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I want to go back to that initial thought that I had at the very beginning, that why doesn't God stop all pain and suffering in the world? I want us to appreciate the magnitude of God's understanding. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself as a kid, or you could go forward in time and be the most advanced and and wise person on the planet, you're still limited. I think that if you're going to get like a a master, if you're considered a master of anything, it's supposedly like 10,000 hours on a certain job to be considered a master of a job. But I tell you this, friends, I could work the rest of my life at pretty much anything. Choose your hobby. Choose your job. I could be the best gift to society that everybody would say, Keith is the best of the best of the best. But I could tell you this, there will be somebody that will be better than me. And when you get to be extremely knowledgeable, isn't it fascinating when you start reading and studying and looking at things around the world, you realize that you don't know anything? I remember when you, when you get your degree in college, I remember thinking, why, why are they, I don't even know what I'm, I don't even know how I got this degree. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that struggle of, I have to be an adult now. I mean, you, can, you think that the degree is going to do something where people will go, oh, wow, you're so smart and you're awesome because you've got a piece of paper with your name on it. But in essence, we also should pre- appreciate that God is 10 million times smarter than us. So when we look at the evil and the suffering, we look at the hardships and the pain, and I don't want to dismiss and downplay because I'm sure there are people in this room that are going through things that I can't even fathom. Okay, I don't want to dismiss your pain and your struggle, the hurt, physical ailments, the loss of loved ones. I, I don't want to dismiss those things. They are huge They are big. They are difficult. But I believe, and I hope that you do too, that God is bigger than anything that we could possibly fathom. No matter how bad it gets, God is still good. No matter how difficult and impossible the odds may seem, God is still in charge. And just like I said, if you could go and visit with yourself when you're 90 years old and look back. If you hadn't been through what you'd been through, you wouldn't have learned what you learned and you wouldn't have experienced what you experienced so that you could be who you were. You can't look back and say, I wish that wouldn't have happened to me. Well, if that wouldn't have happened to me, I wouldn't have learned this lesson and I wouldn't have changed in this way. So, yeah, I don't want the pain. Nobody wants to go back to the pain. Nobody wants to go back to the doubt. Nobody wants to go back to the suffering and the hurt and the hardship. But I tell you this, when you get to the new new version of you, you you can be there for those that you didn't even know you were supposed to be there for. Have you ever gone through something that just seems impossible and then you meet somebody else that needs to hear your story and you go, oh, maybe God had something in mind here. Well, I didn't want to have that story. But now, God can use this story. Are you listening? Will you let God use this story? I, I, I hope, friends, that when you, you remember and you think of all the ways that God has shaped you and molded you and helped you and been there alongside you, I think the Lord grieves alongside us too. And it, it, He's not morbid. Pain and suffering, Jesus and his humanness, he appreciated and understood our pain and our suffering. And he wept. He struggled. He saw people that, can you imagine when he met the rich young ruler and said, 
just give up everything and follow me. And the rich run, young ruler said, no, I can't do that. Can you imagine how many people that Jesus, when he was preaching, as he looked out, I, I can imagine the disciples amping it up and passing out papyrus flyers and stuff and passing it all around the community. Jesus is going to speak. Jesus is going to speak. And all the cities, all they come together and they're gathered and they're just on the hillside and it's just, it's amazing. And Jesus has got the spotlight and he's ready to speak and they're thinking, this is the moment God's going to intervene. We're going to see people accept him. They're going to follow him all the days of their life. God is going to break through. We're going to take over the Roman government. I don't know where they were going in their minds, but they thought this is it. We're going to do this. We're going to have 5,000 people. We got 10,000 people. This is the moment. And what does Jesus preach on? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, where's the exit? Uh, I'm done. I don't want to follow you anymore. Now, that's a pretty, if you've not read that story, I would love to describe it to you another time. But I want you to appreciate that Jesus wasn't about boosting numbers. He wasn't about a huge gathering. He wanted us to follow him, be willing to sacrifice everything and say, Jesus, I'll follow you through thick and thin. I will do whatever you need me to do because I know that you're going to be there. This little blip of time that I exist on this planet is nothing in comparison to the eternity that I'm going to be worshiping you. These trials that I experience right now, as hard as they may be, they are nothing in comparison to eternity. When we, when we feel the pain and the sorrow and the despair, it's okay to say, Jesus, help. Jesus, I'm lost. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. I tell you this, God is always there. And he cares for you. Christ is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Let's look at a couple passages. 1 Peter 1, 18-19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. Amen to that, right? No matter what we try to give our children, it's empty if it doesn't have God. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. We see that reminder that He is the eternal sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God. First Peter 2, verse 24, it says, He personally carried our sins on His body on the cross so that he can be, we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Appreciate that he is God's perfect sacrifice for you. He doesn't just sacrifice himself so that we'd all say, that was nice of him. Thank you. I like, I like it that Jesus died for me. That's really nice. This is beyond John's baptism of repentance from sin. This is saying, Jesus, I follow you because you loved me. I am turning from my wicked ways and saying, God, I'm giving you my everything. The second element is Jesus is the Messiah. He is good. He's perfect, in fact. He's full of truth and justice and righteousness in all of his actions and decisions, leading all people back into a relationship with God. So you see, when it says that he's the Messiah, People had a lot of ways that they defined this. They thought king. They thought one who would overthrow Rome. They thought one who would finally put Israel back on the map. They thought, yes, we are the children of Abraham and, and we've earned this. We are the people of God. We are the ones who, who Moses saved. We are God's people and God is shining on us and smiling on us and, and we need this Messiah to just just fix all of the problems that our government is having, finally put us back into where we need to be. It was like they were thinking to themselves, 
we've got King David in our, in our history, and we want a new King David. God, a man after God's own heart that will just take this land back. I mean, they imagined it as this immediate fix to their solution, but they couldn't have fathomed that he would be the Messiah that God gave them. They couldn't have fathomed a person from Bethlehem, born in Bethlehem, a person that lived in Galilee, the son of a carpenter. Like, how far did David's lineage fall apart? When did it happen? 14 generations. Come on, what happened here? They imagined to themselves that they needed a kingly, tall, dark, and handsome fixer of all their issues. And what they got was the Lamb of God. What they got was God incarnate who was sinless and spotless and perfect and loving. Standards that we could never live by, but this is who he is. I love to look at Jesus as the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all three of those roles. He's fulfilling prophecy. He is priestly in that he is sacrificial of himself for all people. And he's kingly because he sits at the right hand of God and he is judging the world, loving the world, ruling over the world. And he didn't do it with a sword. He did it with self-sacrifice because he wanted us to be in right relationship with him. So I want to look back to Luke 2, verses 8 through 11. You might be like, it's not Christmas time. I know, but this is important. Luke 2, 8 through 11. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. So historically speaking, this Messiah was foretold that he would come to rescue his people from their sins. Yes, he was announced to shepherds and their sheep. Imagine that. The Lamb of God is announced to shepherds. That's a beautiful Little, little play on words there, but it's still beautiful. We also recognize that in this Savior, this message was given, this Messiah message was given to shepherds who had no platform, no speaking ability, nobody listened to them, and they never talked to anybody. They were in town to sell sheep, and then they'd go back into the fields. They were watching sheep all night. I don't know if you've ever watched sheep all night. Whenever I start counting, I lose track and I'm asleep, right? I'm glad God didn't put me in charge of sheep. I'd just come and be like, sorry, I don't know what happened. I fell asleep. Uh, but this is beautiful that God, the Messiah, the Lord, is revealed to shepherds. Now, Acts 26, verse 19. Now, we're jumping. Historically speaking, we're after the life of Jesus now. But this is... Uh, Paul speaking, and as he is, he is uh, basically in, in court to set the scene. But he's revealing and he's reminding them of who Jesus was. Now, he's experienced the life of Christ. He didn't follow Christ in the beginning, but now he has followed Christ. And now he's testifying in court about these truths about God. So Acts 26, 19 through 23 says, And so King Agrippa obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things they do. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. I 
teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen. And the Messiah would suffer and be the first to raise from the dead and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. So his powerful message here, he doesn't care who he's talking to. This man has authority that he could kill Paul in this moment for this blasphemous type words that he's saying. And he says, I don't care. If you try to kill me, then my life is over and uh, I'm, I'm happy to go to heaven. He's already revealed to people, I'm, I'm happy to be on earth, but I'd rather be in heaven. So he's fine with it either way at this point. But he wants to be faithful. He's proclaiming, he's speaking to those that have authority over him as far as man-made authority. And what he is saying is a, f- a fulfillment of prophecy that the prophets foretold that a Messiah was coming Moses said that it would happen, that the people would be redeemed and rescued, and that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead, and he's, he's proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. You don't do this in the courtroom. They already declared that that was a lie. You don't say those types of things, but he's saying he rose from the dead, and he is God's light to the world, and he is here to rescue the Jews and Gentiles alike. So he's speaking to a Gentile about Jesus He's announcing things that have happened, and he's saying he is the one. Will you follow him? What I love about the apostles is that they weren't afraid for their life. Now, when they were with Jesus and they had Jesus with them, they were confused and learning and kind of in a mentorship program, and they hadn't figured it all out. They were arguing a lot, and just, they just didn't get it. But when Jesus dies and raises is is risen from the dead the boldness and the authority that they speak of there was no renouncing their faith there was no turning and running away anymore they spoke of the goodness of god they spoke that jesus was the messiah prophetically speaking historically speaking and i'm willing to die for this that's what the apostles did so when we read these things my prayer is boldness over us that we would appreciate that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And praise God that the sacrificial system has been fulfilled, eternally speaking, by the Messiah, by Jesus. So let me go back to that first sentence that I said, summarize the whole thing. Our Messiah is here. Salvation has come. And God's rescue plan is just getting started. You see, the Lamb's sacrifice is perfect and complete. The Messiah is the fulfillment of all of our needs and our desires. Now, what do we do with this, friends? My hope is there's some layers here. My hope is that there's somebody that's on your mind. My hope is that there's somebody that you, and I want to kind of borrow some of the phrase here. I don't want to get into dicey theological territory, but it's just a burden on my heart as I was preparing. You know when when God the Father speaks to Jesus and he says he's proud of him? How powerful that statement is? I wonder, is there somebody that you need to, to call? to talk with today and say, I'm so proud of you. God loves you. I love you too. Is there somebody that you need to say, can I tell you about my God? Can I tell you how he's ransomed and forgiven me? I also wonder, in your own spirit, if you've considered how important it is that Jesus was sinless and perfect and that he was also a part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. I wonder as this last question is, how are you feeling prompted to worship today? 
And so what I'd like to do is allow us to go into a time of open worship. I'd also like us to, I don't want this to be about timing and, and perfection, but just take 30 seconds at, at least of silence as a room before someone speaks. We're going to have a mic available. But my hope, you say, God, is there somebody on my heart that I need to be paying attention and praying for and, and thinking I need to tell them I'm, I'm pr- God is proud of them, I'm proud of them. Or is there a way that you're feeling prompted to worship God today that you just want to tell others about? Maybe God's just telling you something individually or maybe it's for us corporately. But I want us to pay attention to that. So let's go into open worship and then I will... um, We'll have a song at the end here as well as I'll close us in prayer after the song too. So let's go into open worship together. I like to do this. uh, Lord's put this on my heart. This this jar actually represents half of uh, when you're 9 to 18. So this is like the second half of your childhood. Uh, But I'd like to remind us that Every week matters, um, and another week has taken place. And do how did you represent Jesus to your family this week? And I just want us to hear this and remember that another week is coming, and the weeks are always flying by, but I want us to remember this. Let's pray. Jesus, we have opportunity to go, to be your hands and feet, And we thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit, not only to your Son, but you sent it to us as well after Jesus returned to heaven. Lord, I pray that the promptings that you put on our heart, we would be responsive to. We would want to live out the good news of the gospel in our families and in our communities and all across this nation. In this church body, that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus and we can, as a community of believers, we can encourage one another. And I pray a blessing on each and every person that's heard today, and those that couldn't be here today as well. We ask that you would be their Lord and their God and their Messiah, for you are the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And we trust you, and we follow you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Go with God's grace and his peace. You are dismissed.